Now I'm honored to introduce our speaker. Stephen Chavez is a licensed landscape architect and founder of SCAALARC, Stephen Chavez Associates Landscape Architecture in NAMLA, uh, National Association of Minority Landscape Architects. Stephen received a Bachelor's of Landscape Architecture from the University of Washington, a Master's of Fine Art and Photography from the University of Ulster, and is currently a Doctor Design Candidate at the College of Design at North Carolina State University. Mr. Chavez worked under the tutelage of Gustafsson Guthrie Nicole before starting SCAALARC in 2009. Today, he's presenting his talk, Why and Namla. Welcome, Stephen. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to speaking and getting some questions towards the end. I think the presentation will be about 30 minutes, so there'll be plenty of time for questions. And um, again, thank you for that introduction. And, um, so let me go ahead and start sharing screen. So as Lila said, I'm the founder of NAMLA, which started last year um, with uh, Sarah Abed uh, here in Southern California. And I thought I'd start this presentation first with a little bit of a background. And I think that kind of helps convey uh, my trajectory, not just to landscape architecture, but my concerns and for um, minority representation in landscape architecture. So starting uh, with the San Fernando Valley, I was born and raised in the San Fernando Valley. So the San Fernando Valley is just north of Los Angeles. It's within the city and county um, limits of LA County in LA City. And um, these humongous mountains wrap around this valley. And um, when I was a kid, I always wondered what's going on on the other side of those mountains because they were, they were just like a giant wall. <laughs> surrounding the valley and I used to have these crazy imaginations that there's like dinosaurs and stuff on the other side of those mountains because I had never been on the other side. Um, but um, so yeah, born and raised in the San Fernando Valley and in the 70s, 80s, and uh, I don't know if any of you remember the movie uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, but that was very much what it was like in the valley back at that time in the 1980s. Um, lots of kids in the streets playing and a lot of people on bicycles and stuff like that so um very fond of that upbringing there and then here this is me at two years old in 1974 in a city of the san fernando valley called um, pacoima and um, i lived there until i was about 12 years old and then moved around to different parts of the valley um, so I'm here with my uncles um, and my, my chihuahua dog named Tiki. And this is a front yard of uh, our little house, and uh, which was two houses on one lot. And um, it was on Laura Canyon. And when I tell my wife it was on Laura Canyon, she always makes fun of me. You didn't grow up in Laura Canyon, you know, with Joni Mitchell and all them. I said, no, of course not. This is the flatland of Laura Canyon down in the valley. But um, it was really interesting growing up there with, um, again, two houses on one lot, and there was a family that moved to the back house that had siblings um, all around the same age and the same amount of siblings as our family. So it was a fun time, and we got to do a lot of really fun things like going to the beach and taking trips and going cruising and all that kind of stuff. So. Very fond memories of that time, for sure. So um, growing up in mostly uh, Mexican-American, Chicano um, area, Pacoima, San Fernando. Um, my first art appreciation was actually from uh, Chicano style gang lettering, which um, back at that time, there was quite a bit of it. And um, not the refined stuff, but more like the quick, I guess you could say like in graffiti, they call them throw ups, really quick throw ups. Um, but they just had something about them, a style, uh, uh, a formality, uh, 
um, an aesthetic, uh, and then also conveyed a sense of uh, of what you know that gang's uh, what they're trying to convey. Whether there's territoriality or not, but um, so my brother was involved in, in gangs when we, you know, we were young, and so the very first time I saw this kind of lettering was underneath my living room coffee table where he scribed it in he carved it into the bottom of his wood table <laughs> and um ever since then it's like really stuck with me you know it's just been and i still very much appreciate it and i've noticed how it changed in the decades from the 70s and you know where you had this kind of like block letters that leaned back um and in the 80s and nine especially in the 90s i think there was more even more gang aggression and stuff like that, where the letters kind of represented the more aggressive nature of like leaning forward and a little bit more aggressive look to the lettering, which is interesting. Um, and then there's a hybrid of uh, some of the gang lettering that I thought is interesting that combines both like Japanese style here in LA with Chicano lettering, um, which, uh, yeah, it's still very much, I still very much appreciate it as an art form and don't necessarily see any kind of negative connotation with it. And my second art appreciation um, was custom painted lowriders. Um, again, growing up Mexican-American, Chicago neighborhood, there were a lot of these type of cars um, cruising around and some of them, my family, in fact, this was uh, my uncle's 65 Impala. Um, custom painted by an artist named Mario Gomez, and Mario Gomez was well known in the San Fernando Valley. And he had a shop called the Candy Factory, um, which did these just remarkable paint jobs um, on these mostly 1960s lowriders, early 70s lowriders. And the story with this one is really interesting: is that my uncle took the car to Mario for uh, to repaint it in its original color and straight paint job and um, a few weeks later he went to pick up the car and it was painted in this butterscotch with all these patterns on it and stuff so really surprised him but he was he was happy to see that um and it was a fantastic paint job but yeah um kind of shows that sometimes when you work with an artist you might not they might not necessarily follow all the rules or what your your original program is you know um, so this car, along with another one from the same car club, um, I believe he was in the same car club as Malco called Reflections Car Club, was parked in my driveway in Lower Canyon. And I remember as a little kid, just slowly walking around, it was full Sunday, and looking at all the details from the pinstriping to the taper shades, and fadeaways, all that kind of stuff. And that really, really stuck with me. And I just knew then that I was interested in some form of art, even though I wasn't really conscious of exactly it was art, art itself. I just knew that whatever this was, it was quite fascinating. I was probably eight or nine years old. So the interest in custom cars and even graffiti, uh, going from that gang lettering, I call it cholo lettering, to what happened in the in the 80s with the hip hop culture and the graffiti coming from the East Coast, Philadelphia, and New York and all that. Um, so I went through a period of like really being interested in wild style lettering, I started some graffiti crews and junior high and stuff like that. But cars always stuck with me and I always had this interest in, in custom cars. And it wasn't just lowriders, it was customs from the 50s and 60s to Cadillac Volkswagens, et cetera. So I was able, I got lucky and uh, was able to do an apprenticeship uh, in my early 20s with a custom car legend named Gene Winfield. And um, he's actually still customizing. He's been building cars since the 1950s. Now he's in Mojave, Mojave Desert. He's in his 90s, his early 90s, and he's still out there painting and welding and stuff like that on these cars. But that was quite a learning experience. Um, and he took the time to really teach me, you know, late nights in the shop and stuff like that, how to mix paint, how to work with metal. And, you know, I learned a lot about form, 
fit, finish, proportion, um, and a lot of things like that. But that was a, and then I asked him because he was such a custom car legend, I asked him, so what is your favorite custom car that he ever built? And he said it was a solar scene and this is a solar scene. Um, that's what he titled it as one of his favorite cars. And I just think that it is pretty amazing. So I couldn't afford like the lowriders and the customs and stuff like that. I had, so I bought a, an old Volkswagen van, sort of like the ones you see from the 1950s and 60s that were kind of like used as hippie vans at the time. It's an old panel van, 1958, and loved it. Drove it around a lot and stuff. But the only thing about those is there's, you know, you don't want to crash in those because there's nothing in the front. Um, orthopedic doctors joke that your knees are the shock absorbers. And so unfortunately I got to an accident in one of those and one of my lower left leg um, had to be amputated. So after that, I thought, you know, well, I have a vested interest. I like working with my hands. I'm gonna look into prosthetics and orthotics and be able to make my own prosthetic limbs, you know. Um, so I did that, I did that for about uh, say a year or maybe two years, a year to two years. And I worked at the, uh, I volunteered at the VA hospital, first in Los Angeles and then in Seattle. Learned a lot about the fabrication and really you know, have to say it is a true art form, true coming together of art and science and you know, with a significant impact on, on improving people's lives, direct impact in, in individuals' lives. So I still have a very, very high um, admiration for people that do this type of work, um, prosthetics and orthotics, and the technology associated with it. So I wasn't sure if I wanted to go back into automotive customizing and kind of a prosthesis of still rehabilitating. I thought, well, okay, well, I'm going to think about going back to college. Um, by the way, I never even went to high school. I went to enroll in high school and the day I went to go enroll in high school we had an earthquake right when I was enrolling and I ran out of there and I never went back <laughs> so it was like a sign <laughs> plus I never liked school anyways you know I was always ditching junior high but I did get my GED and then I was like okay well I'm gonna go to community college um, and so I went to community college and I was thinking about this idea of architecture because it's kind of related I guess you can say in form and stuff like that at a different scale, of course, but it reminded me a little bit of automotive customization. Um, and I simply just didn't even know what landscape architecture was at that time. So I wrote, enrolled at the Bellevue Community College, um, just east of Seattle, and took some GE courses. Um, well, actually, first towards prosthetics and orthotics, and then shifted over to architecture. And I shifted over to architecture actually after working for an artist, Seattle artist um, named Betsy Eby. And um, she had a, both a studio that did fine art and caustic paintings, and then also another wing of that, um, which was called Art for Architecture. And she did a lot of Venetian plaster for a lot of the local Seattle architect firms. And so I would, you know, go and deliver samples and pick up samples. And I would go to a lot of these firms in Seattle and you know, Olsen Kandig, you know, Olsen Sundberg kind of at the time was, was a huge firm. And I was just like wowed by it. You know? And I was like, wow, I want to look into architecture. So I um, started to think about that. And um, so in her library, she, I mean, in her studio, she had this, library of art books, architecture books, design books, and it was like a little treasure trove for me. I was just going through them and I came across this book by Carlos Scarpa and uh, was really blown away by, um, I can't even really describe what it was, you know, exactly is just the, you know, going back to custom cars, the proportion, the honesty of materials, the textures, the um, form, the and then also the relationship to landscape, the buildings, the architecture to the landscape um, wasn't just a building in and of itself as an object, but it really um, kind of dovetailed with the landscape really nicely. Um, 
So that kind of thing, I mean, okay, I'm gonna try architecture and I'm gonna to go towards and pursue architecture. So I shifted focus from prosthetics to architecture and my GPs. Living in the Northwest, there was um, a lot of architecture there. Um, I don't know what it is, maybe I just like a lot of stuff from, I guess, the mid century and stuff, um, whether it's cars or whatever. But um, the Pacific Northwest contemporary regional architecture from starting with the Watsik House, which was a really early exam example. I think this was built in the 30s, um, but it didn't really pick up. Style didn't really pick up um, and become more widespread through the Northwest until I would say like the 50s through the 1970s or the 80s. Um, and I was just, um, I love the way that the Pacific Northwest contemporary style um, blended into the landscape using cedar and local materials and also very minimal impact on the landscape. Um, a lot of these homes were tucked into um, the original landscape, removing few trees as possible, leaving the native vegetation, nothing ornamental about the landscape really, uh, it was just house and landscape. And uh, that really appealed to me. And, and particularly this uh, Watsik house, and this is actually um, in Portland, Oregon. And um, John Young was, I think in his early twenties when he built this, built this house with such, such fine craftsmanship and details. Um, but I just could not believe early 20s. Yeah. And um, so a lot of the other architects were Ralph Anderson, William Lovett, um, and of course, John Yeon, as well as many other Pacific Northwest contemporary architects, which I'm still influenced by today, although the style has definitely changed. So while at Bellevue Community College, I was taking my GEs and I had a course in environmental science and was just enthralled by it. Really, really brought me in and thinking about a lot of different things in a lot of different complex ways. And my instructor was really fantastic. So I would think about all these things that are in this image. Here is this ward collage of pollution, water ecosystems, and thinking of things as systems. Uh, related um, to the environment. Having grown up in LA in the 70s and 80s and the air pollution there was so bad. And, um, the access to parks and nature and you know, rivers were not really, they were more like concrete channels and stuff like that. So I was really influenced by environmental science. And I thought, well, how can I incorporate this into this idea of architecture? And so then I learned a little bit about landscape architecture and thought, well, that's a perfect blend. Environmental science, architecture, work with the land, do something related to design and form and all that. And, um, and for, for public parks, natural systems. Um, so I decided to pursue landscape architecture. So uh, I went to a couple of lectures, one by David Stretfield at Bellevue Community College on modern gardens, Japanese gardens. And then before going into the landscape architecture program at the University of Washington, I took a summer course in the history of modern landscape architecture. And um, that's when I knew right away that this was very, very interesting and it was a calling in. So I applied to the University of Washington department, uh, landscape architecture department for the Bachelor of Landscape Architecture program and started in, um, in 2000. And, um, and then I got lucky, I was able to work in this kind of like contemporary Northwest, even a brutalist style building, which um, I loved and a lot of students did not like it. And I was, um, why this is cool this is really really, really cool design one of the students there is that i was in the same cohort as i his, his dad actually designed this this space with a couple of other architects so um great memories there for sure so being in seattle is a lot different than los angeles um, in a lot of different ways and um 
one of the things that I found fascinating was the amount of in-city parks along waterfronts or along rivers kind of just um, strewn across all of Seattle. And um, Richard Haig's work here at Gasworks Park and especially his little project on the Seattle uh, waterfront, Steinbrook Park was very influential and like um, just the way that he would work in terms of like space and concept and, and materials and nothing too stylized but still had its own authorship but it was mostly about site and responding to site conditions and um, doing it in a way that was very unique um, again without it being sort of this hyper stylized um, these hyper stylized places so the, all these parks around Seattle um, on weekends I would go and just it was like again a treasure trove and I would uh, sort of go park hopping on the weekends and everything from this you know, Gasworks Park, which is open with views and not many trees and just overlooking Lake Union to uh, Schmitz Park in West Seattle, where you got Old Gold Forest and all within you know 10 minute drive from each other. Um, so that maintained my interest in landscape architecture for sure living there in Seattle at that time. And then um, some the work of Gustafson got to be nickel. Um, they were, I think, pretty young at the time, probably in their around five years old. And I when I learned about their work and saw what was coming out of their office, I was also very fascinated. Um, especially like this project here across from the promenade and this scrim of water the tones, the metal work, the woodwork, the fit, the finish, all that kind of stuff, again, kind of just stopped me, made me think about like custom cars and fine detail and proportion, but then also, you know, use and, um, and design for, for people. And so I, uh, during one of my reviews at the University of Washington, I think it was only in my second year, um, Shannon Nickel was invited and, um, uh, you know, she had very, very good um, feedback for all the students, of course, and she's an excellent designer. And um, I had a project, I think it was called the Northwest History and Industry Play Garden. And um, I had taken a Boeing, because of the history of Boeing in the Northwest, I had taken the shell of a Boeing airplane and from one of the wings, I cantilevered it out over a slope and then cut the roof off, sort of like customizing a car. <laughs> and put glass on the roof and turned it into a greenhouse with the wing being the walkway into there. And um, uh, so I think she was interested in that project. And so she I said, if I'm ever interested in doing a practicum or internship, stay in touch. And I emailed her and I was able to get in that summer to do a practicum. And then that practicum led to um, contract employment with them for a couple of years where I learned a lot in a very fast paced environment. and. Um, at all different levels of landscape architecture from small scale to large scale stuff. The really, really amazing team. So I, after working at GGN, um, moved back home, um, mostly because my mom's health was deteriorating. She's got kind of diabetes. And so I wanted to get back closer to home, uh, be with her and be with family. And um, so I came back home and then I started a small landscape architecture home office, basically out of my bedroom, just the landscape design and thought, okay, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna work on my law exams and um, see where it goes. Um, so I started the practice called Scalark, um, Stephen Chavez Associates Landscape Architecture, uh, even though it's still a design practice at that time. <laughs> and. Um, got through the wires, um, slowly but surely, one at a time. And that grading and drainage one almost killed me. So survive that. Um, so um, I'm gonna go ahead and share 
go straight to these links and talk about just a couple of programs. I mean, projects, and then come back and then we'll get into NAMLA. So over the years, I was able to get, um, and it did take quite a bit of time to get uh, small business enterprise certification, um, disadvantaged business enterprise certification, minority business enterprise certification with a lot of different agencies, um, thinking that that's going to be helpful to procure work, especially for somebody who wants to do work in the public realm. And uh, unfortunately, I've had a lot of those certifications for probably oh, seven years now. And I have to say, I haven't gotten one task order um, I've been under of, as a firm. I've, I've applied for projects as a sub for larger prime firms, um, but I never got any task orders. So um, makes me wonder how effective those are in, you know, if a lot of MBEs, minority business enterprise firms and stuff like that actually do get work or if it's just a formality or what, um, but it's been very, very challenging. So I do, you know, speculative work and then also small residential work. Um, but um, so one of the projects, this is kind of typical of what I do in terms of residential. And uh, this is a project in Santa Monica. So small front yard, um, thinking about drought tolerant species, low maintenance, and things like that. So this is typical of the scale that I'm working at, at this time um, with these residential type of projects. But even though the scale, uh, even if it's small or it's a balcony or a little tiny strip on the side yard, I always think about ways of how can I improve the environment, even in this small, small intervention. Um, hey, Stephen? Yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but I think um, when you clicked the link, we weren't able to make the transition to the link with you. Uh, we're still viewing your presentation. Oh, okay, okay. Let me get let me get that. Sorry, I forgot. I didn't hit the share screen. Let me go back there. That's just a. Are you able to see the website now, or is it still? Yes, we're with you now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah, so this is typical of the projects I work on, small residential in Los Angeles area. Um, and as I said, um, no matter what the scale is, whether it's a small you know, side yard or it's the full landscape, whatever, I really think about um, making a, some sort of positive impact on the environment. If they have a lot of plants that use a lot of water and stuff like that, I try to take those out and Place them, replace them with drought tolerant species and also low maintenance, because a lot of my clients want low maintenance um, plant materials. So this is this is a typical project that I have, very small scale. Um, but then I also do speculative work. Um, I've done work for competitions and stuff like that. Um, but the speculative work um, I really enjoy and I'm able to do more of that now because I'm teaching part-time both at Cal Poly Pomona and UCLA. So it gives me that opportunity to work on projects um, that I guess you could say non-traditional. So this is an idea I had for um, parklets and you know thinking about parking day. And the first thing I thought about when I see parking day installation is like, oh my God, safety, you know, like there's a couple of potted plants and stuff and there's cars zooming by and I'm just thinking, oh, what if a car veers off, that's very dangerous. So um, one of the first things I thought about is, you know, just thinking about these low boy containers and seeing those during remodels, house remodels and stuff like that. And, and in the front yard, right in a parking space, space and they're solid, and I thought, well, is there any way that, you know, going back to customizing cars and you kind of this idea of the bricolier, you know, you kind of get something and you customize the heck out of it or whatever and make it your own. Um, so I thought about getting these low boy 
containers, which are pretty inexpensive new, and there's a lot of use, a lot of use ones available, um, and um, customizing them. So, and I had thought about two different types. Uh, well, one thing is they fit perfectly in a nine by 19 parking space, and then two different types would be um, for parallel parking and then angled parking and retrofitting them with solar louvers that move up and down for privacy and stuff like that. And then definitely had to have, like I had this set of parameters that had to have two trees in this location. The trees can be different, of course, depending on location and all that stuff. Uh, brick veneer floors, wood plank, you know, metal, solar louvers, um, creating some electricity for um, plugging in uh, laptops and stuff like that. So kind of just went crazy with this idea of like a, my my way of not having an old car anymore to customize. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna customize one of these. So this is the angled parking model and you can see this is where you'd come in from the curb. Um, and then the parallel you would come in, the sidewalk would be here and you would walk in this way. Um, so safe. Um, car beers off it's you're going to feel the impact of course but it's a lot safer than just say potted plants and stuff like that in a parking space um so it's kind of a kit of parts figured it would be about twenty thousand twenty five thousand to build one of these and then this is what it'd be in, in context an angled spot um and then i put a row of them as outdoor study rooms at Cal Poly Pomona's Nitro Plaza. And what I like most about the idea is that they could be transportable. So there's already a system in place of moving these little boys um, for construction. And I think it would be easy to tap into that um, to move these portable parks to different places. So I still have this practice. I'm usually taking on just like one project at a time and while teaching. And then also around 2009, I, well, I've been um, using photography as a learning tool from about 2000, 1999 for landscape architecture just studying landscapes and I mean, a lot of detailed shots of construction and stuff like that. And uh, um, started to take it a little bit more, I guess, serious around 2009 and think about it as, as photography, composition, and narrative and all that kind of stuff. But I found that I didn't go out thinking, well, I'm gonna take, you know, it's gonna be about public art, architecture and landscapes. It was like, I was taking a bunch of pictures and then I realized, okay, this is, this is about, this is what my interest is. This is what I'm doing intuitively. And it had to do with public and civic spaces. Um, so from about 2009 to now, I have been taking photographs. So work was definitely pretty slow around the time around 2015. I decided to go back to school, get an MFA. And there was a program at the University of Ulster um, that I applied for and I was able to get in. It was a small court of just five people and um, Martin Parr and Donovan Wiley and some really, really good photographers were teaching there. So I was very fortunate to learn under them. And um, so one of the projects I had was thinking about Ed Ruscha's work and um, his project, every building on the Sunset Strip, um, sort of like putting together a predetermined set of parameters for a project. So you already know what you're gonna do. You're gonna set up and then you're gonna shoot, shoot, shoot. And um, so this project I had called Running Water um, tells the story of the Alley River from its, from its source, the full journey, um, which is something like, 52 miles, 48 to 52 miles from the San Fernando Valley where it starts all the way to Long Beach. And what I did is I had this set of parameters of I'm gonna to go to every bridge that crosses the river. I wanna look at the river going downhill 
I'm going to find the engineer's pin or stamp where that center point of the bridge is, and I'm going to set up a tripod, standard 50 millimeter lens, and shoot it, no matter if it's good looking or bad looking, or the composition's off or it's good, that's what it is. Um, so I was able to get 72 images of 72 bridges um, for this project. And this is one near, near East Los Angeles. The University of Washington, Brutalism Architecture, which I really like. This is by the artist and architect group uh, of Seattle back in the 60s and 70s. Or again, these are all public or civic spaces. This is a, uh, a trail in Oregon near the Columbia River. I did a, a couple of projects for the Los Angeles Conservatory um, related to historic preservation and architecture here. So this is City Hall in downtown LA. This is also part of Running Water Project. Frank Murphy Sculpture Garden, public space at UCLA, fantastic lands coming together of architecture, landscape, and art. Matthias Botanical Garden, Robert Earn's work in Pasadena, the Seattle Monorail, Tongva Park Overlook. Hiking Trail in Los Angeles, Marion Canyon. Broad, I guess you could say Civic Space, Interior of the Broad by DSR. McGuire Gardens right outside of the Central Library in downtown LA. And was able to get this guy, which looks like some of the skyrocket trees right next to him. Um, again, from running water. So this is one portion of the LA River where it is um, pretty natural, actually soft bottom, soft sides um, on portions of it, but it's a short stretch. And uh, it's in the Sepulveda Basin. Interesting thing about photographing the LA River is that no matter if it was like all concrete channel lined, um, no vegetation whatsoever, just a water trench going through it, or if it was more like this, um, in terms of uh, wildlife, it was funny how there was always uh, a couple, either ducks or a couple of, um, of birds or something sitting on wires, but I would always see a couple together. It was really interesting. Um, Calle Ocho, Calle Ocho in Miami. And then Beverly Hills, Concourse Car Show on Rodeo Drive. Multnomah Falls. Another one from the Alley River. See how it shifts quite a bit. And lately, been doing more, I guess, using my iPhone a lot too. It's just photographs of everyday landscapes, everyday materials, and the appreciation of those. So in 2018, fall 2018, I started um, working at UCL Extension. Stephanie Landergan brought me in and been teaching both uh, introductory studio and then third year studio. And this is some work by actually first year, first studio uh, student named Teresita Larain, she's from Chile and um, blew me away. She just incredible talent and skills. I've been focusing on this little project for that studio. It's a 60 by 60 space near the Frank Murphy Sculpture Garden. And then also at Cal Poly Pomona, at the same time, from no teaching experience at all, and somebody who dropped out of um, high school and whatever. And in fact, when I talked to my friends from back then, they're like, what are you doing in college? You're the last person uh, to teaching all of a sudden in, you know, Cal Poly Pomona UCLA in the fall of 2018. And uh, so this is um, a project. This was first year, first studio students. And 
they were crazy enough to listen to me to do this, these wood structures here. You know, we were supposed to do some little project, like something in the scale of this nature here and up to the bottom right. Um, and I don't know, I was able to convince them to do these crazy panels and uh, they went along with it. <laughs> so it was their first uh, studio and it was my first time teaching and we kind of learned together. And um, so these are, uh, we kind of titled these six, six site triangle disruptions. So the whole concept was disruption. So we're disrupting the site triangles on those corners in that plaza, Metro Plaza. And they joked, instead of the Great Walls of China, they called them the Great Walls of Chavez because I was so determined to get these things built. And in 2020, this is uh, me and Sarah Bed, you know, I had this idea about NAMLA for about five years, parked on a Facebook page. And uh, I knew I couldn't get it going by myself. I didn't really have the energy and all that kind of stuff. And, and um, I knew I needed somebody um, to help me. And I, I came across um, Sarah Abed in, I guess, early 2020. And um, I was thinking about restarting. I did an Instagram post and she saw that. And then she spread it out through uh, landscape architecture, uh, I guess, forum. And when I saw her do that, I said, wow, she's, you know, she's really passionate about it too, about this idea of, of people of color, minorities and landscape architecture. And um, um, contacted her and um, she really did give the organization a booster shot and kind of really helped get it going. So let me know if you can't see this side, but you should be able to. Um, so it took a while to figure out exactly, I mean, I knew for sure that we had problems in landscape architecture with minority um, representation, minorities even going into it to begin with. Um, and then once they're in it, well, you know, where do they go from there and do they end up exiting or is it, you know, but from my own experiences and from other experiences, some other people that I know that are also in the field, I felt like something really, really needed to be done. So thinking about um, writing, you know, a statement of purpose, and we did that last summer. So um, I'll go ahead and read that because I think it's really important. So the National Association of Minority Landscape Architects is a 501c3 organization. We were able to luckily get that within a few months. Founded in Los Angeles, California in 2020. And the premise for starting the organization is based on increasing minority representation. And this is important at all levels, at all levels of landscape architecture, both practice and academia. So we're always talking about, oh, we need to get more people to go into the, to the profession. We, they, you know, they don't know about it. We got to get them through school and all that. But um, you know, I think that there's a lot of people that have gone through that and are maybe you could be self-taught and you're still not getting in any of these uh, roles of being, say, at the different levels of landscape architecture. You know, being a student is one thing, but, you know, staying in the field and upward mobility is another. So NAMLA plans to do this by providing educational and career development assistance to minorities while confronting. And we believe that this is really a structural problem. Um, it's a structural type of racism that goes beyond just landscape architecture. In landscape architecture, the racism you see in landscape architecture is basically a symptom of a broader um, system or structural system of racism that's both governmental, institutional, et cetera, you know, down to, to you know, media and all that stuff. And that, that has disproportionately kept people of color from having decision-making roles um, on how our landscapes are programmed and how they're designed and how they're taught. So this is who we are. We can a little bit more about our purpose, um, education, career development, leadership, I'm not going to go into too many details there because we look at running out of time here. Firm directory. Um, so we've been building a firm directory of MBEs, minority business enterprise landscape architecture firms. And um, we ask that if you do know of an MBE or disadvantaged business enterprise firm, landscape architecture firm, please email us so we can put them on our directory. And then we've recently started job listings for 
um, for firms that are looking to diversify their staff. And to get involved, please reach out to us. We're really looking to hear your stories um, and especially feature your work. All right, let me move forward because time's getting thin. So why NAML? Well, I talked a little bit about that already, but these, I guess, are the quick five points, you know, Cabousier has five points of architecture, kind of our five points. So to publish the work of minority firms, academics, and students to prove minorities have equal talents and capabilities as non-minorities. Two, to advocate for minority-owned landscape architecture firms to lead, lead landscape architecture projects, especially in BIPOC communities. There's communities that are 80, 80 something percent Latino and the work that is being done in terms of their public spaces is usually going to white on firms and I think that needs to change. To advocate for tenure and tenure track minority teachers in landscape architecture programs. Again, especially in programs with a high percentage of BIPOC students or their state colleges with a high percentage of the population is paying taxes towards um, the state run um, institution, that that should also be considered. To encourage and advocate for a self-taught and apprenticeship, apprenticeship trajectory to becoming a landscape. If the hurdles are too much financially, time-wise, not just financially, but in terms of time, then um, what is the, the alternative? Is there another trajectory? Is there a reason, you know, today Alondo, Lake Cabousier, Peter Zumpler, Frank Wood Wright, all of these great minds, um, self-taught. And to utilize research and publishing to shed light on racial inequality and in landscape architecture practice in academia. And I don't really have time to show examples, but there is an Instagram page called Architecture So White that they do data visualization and it's quite shocking. And this is for architecture. And I wanna see how landscape architecture compares to architecture in terms of its diversity. That's, that's it. Questions, anybody? I know that time is, I thought I was gonna go through that really quick and it took a little, a lot longer than I thought. Uh, thank you, Stephen, so much for your, your talk and um, all those wonderful insights. Um, I'm going to start by uh, reading off some of our, our questions. Um, so the first question that we have, um, Kofi Boone talked about broadening the scope of what we talk about as landscape architecture practice. Uh, what do you think the profession has to gain by reflecting on urban landscape expressions such as those you started your presentation with? Well, I think it has a lot to gain, especially um, when you think about music or you think about sports, or you think about a lot of these other, I mean, I guess music and fine arts come to mind, but especially music. Um, by bringing in people that not necessarily um, that have these upbringings and these kind of environments where they're, you know, and I think a lot of it, it usually needs to be kind of like the lower income levels, um, the lower income environments that have this kind of like makeshift curricular type of um, construction and aesthetic to it, that it can really diversify and make people feel like those public spaces are more they, they get more sense of ownership of those public spaces if they're somehow related, you know, aesthetically and spatially and all those things to somebody who's doing some of the design work that is coming from those places. So um, uh, thinking about like, say, you know, the, the genius of Kendrick Lamar or Solange Knowles and all those type of creatives, you know, and, you know, growing up, in Pacoima, San Fernando Valley, there's a lot of really, really creative people and artistic talents and stuff like that, but they didn't have necessarily the um, confidence, I guess, to pursue something like that. They just thought like architecture, no way, I can't do that, you know? Um, but maybe some kind of shift in the, in the paradigm of ar architecture and not necessarily feeling like it's gonna be like this, um, this culture of architecture, perfectionism and suit and tie and all that, but making it more, diverse in, in, in how it reflects back into the community, especially communities of color, lower income, to kind of help lure them into it. But I think a lot of them are deterred, even myself, 
I start thinking about the perfectionism, you know, not being able to make mistakes when you talk or, you know, not answering the phone perfectly right, you know, all this kind of stuff. It just, you're just like, I don't want to deal with that. You know, so there's a lot of big, big things that need to happen. The full paradigm shift. Thank you. I, I think that's a very insightful question and a very insightful answer. Um, the next question, uh, what, um, I'm sorry, how do you envision NAMWA collaborating with our professional organizations such as ASLA, CLARB, and LAAB? Um, I think we've done already a few talks with ASLA, the, the local chapters, city chapters, state chapters, and, you know, we're open to continuing to, um, to work with ASLA on, on these I guess, systemic challenges. And with CLARB, we have not, um, but we want to, but especially with like, say, the NCARB, um, how they have a lot of data for architects who are taking the exams, you know, race, color, socioeconomic status, and all that. We want to do that with um, with CLARB and the LAR exams and finding out that data and seeing how that compares with um, other professions like, say, engineering or architecture. And um, I get feeling that it's probably a lot worse in terms of diversity and representation of minorities. The next question, um, uh, I believe minority faculty increase minority interest in landscape architecture. So shouldn't programs with low levels of diversity need more diverse faculty as well? Yeah, I think so. I think um, you, you, know, you flip it, you, do, you mirror it and um, invert it and you got, you know, where I grew up, it was all Latinos and all the teachers were white, you know, so why can't it be the other way around? If it's all white students, why can't it be, you know, all black teachers or all Latino teachers or Asian teachers? Yeah. The next question, um, what is it like to be a person of color or a member of uh, Latinx in landscape architecture? Um, I think it's, um, you're always what you're, so to begin with, like when I was in customizing cars, I didn't think about race. When I grew up, I didn't think about race. When I was into law riders and, you know, hanging out with guys that were gangs and all that, didn't think about race, even in, you know, that culture. I didn't start thinking about race until probably the second or third year in college. And, uh, and it has stuck and it's been a constant probe um, ever since you know, up until now, you know, it's going to continue. But I think that has a lot to do with, you know, and it's not the blatant racism you see, you kind of see, you know that, and I guess saw that when I was younger, you knew it, and you, you, you know, dealt with it, but then you still hang out with the same people that are, deal with that kind of stuff. It's, it's the undercurrent type of racism. It's the systemic type of racism. It's a, um, it's a lot of, you know, the type of racism that is sort of like, you know, politically, it's kind of on, in the center. It's like um, not far right, not far left, whatever, but it's it's there and it's a constant reminder. And then we're also dealing with land and what is land, land is power, who has ownership over that and who wants to say how land is designed, program, all that kind of stuff and uh, not willing to, to ease up on that. So. It's been a, a major, major challenge, and it's, it's, it's a constant battle every day to not let it kind of consume you. But going into this, never thought about race, but it's a major problem if it's something that is constantly probing at you as you're going through your education and your professional development. Um, Stephen, I just thank you again for um, all of your insights and your talk and sharing your work. Um, we'll end here um, to accommodate the next Zoom session. And thank you again. And thank you, everyone, for attending. And enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody.